This is what the coast of Texas looked like as Hurricane Alicia moved ashore before dawn today. I'm Roger Mudd, NBC News, Washington. Hurricane Alicia slammed into the Texas coast this morning just west of Galveston and headed toward Houston. At least two people were killed in the Houston area. Damage from Alicia is expected to exceed a billion dollars. Texas Governor Mark White has asked that six counties be granted federal disaster aid, and President Reagan has directed that federal resources be made available. We have two reports tonight, the first from Robert Elliott in Galveston. When morning came to Galveston Island, the devastating effects of Hurricane Alicia could be seen. The 100 mile an hour winds brought floods to the streets, knocked out power, leaving island residents without lights or water. The wind also littered the island with broken parts of homes, hotels, and other buildings. But it was worse during the night as the eye of the storm passed near the city. This was the scene at the Hotel Galvez, where windows exploded and walls collapsed. There was near panic when wind broke through the windows. The strength of Hurricane Alicia was immense. It ripped up trees by the roots, caved in homes, turned over trailers, and ripped off sides from coastal hotels and condominiums. Galveston firefighters were hampered by rain and high winds in battling a major cotton warehouse blaze. The weather also hindered search efforts. They're telling me she could still be in there. Maybe. We don't know. We're not letting any civilian people in at all. As the weather cleared, residents left temporary shelters to survey property damage. But Alicia left behind some hidden barriers. We were just making a left-hand turn onto the street, and there was no street. Despite repeated warnings, most of Galveston's 60,000 residents decided to stay on the island and ride out the storm. I've been here all my life. No sense leaving now. At this point, it's too early to estimate the cost of all the damage in Galveston, but it's expected to run into the millions of dollars. It could take months to rebuild what Alicia has destroyed. Robert Elliott, NBC News, Galveston. When the hurricane left Galveston, it headed straight for Houston. Winds gusting to 97 miles an hour hit the nation's fifth largest city at dawn. Houston's new glass-lined skyscrapers were hit hard. It's been 22 years since a major hurricane came here. With the wind came rain, more than six inches of rain, sheets of it, relentless for hours. For a time, every major city street was flooded. The eye of Alicia moved through Houston about 8 a.m., six hours after the storm first came ashore. 13,000 people have moved into 80 Red Cross evacuation centers, most before the storm hit, some after. We had originally planned to ride out the hurricane in our home, but when the tornado hit, then there was no way. We knew that we had to get out. The winds were still, at that time, blowing 70 to 80 mile an hour gusts. It's difficult to hold your car on the road. There were more than 50 tornadoes. The twisters killed two people in Houston. A million and a half people are without electricity in the Houston-Galveston area. Houston Power and Light says 75% of its system was knocked out, and it will be weeks before repairs can be completed. Closer to the coast, in Nassau Bay and Clear Lake, boats were tossed around like toys. This is not the Gulf of Mexico. It's a city street in Baytown, Texas. I didn't think it was going to be that bad, but it's got worse than what we thought it would. Surfside and Freeport, Texas, had been bracing for a direct hit. But Alicia veered north just before landfall and spared most of this coastal area. Most beachfront homes survived the winds. Some did not. There was extensive damage to a marina. A number of businesses were destroyed. There were 8 to 10 foot tides here, but the water was already receding as the backside of the hurricane cleared the coast. And by late afternoon, the sun had come out. Heavy rain squalls are still moving through Houston, but for the most part, Hurricane Alicia has left. It will be a storm that will not soon be forgotten, though. For one little girl, it will never be. She was born last night and named Alicia. Roger O'Neill, NBC News, Houston. Forecasters were able to tell when and where Alicia was likely to go ashore by flying into the eye of the hurricane and taking measurements. Such techniques have vastly improved hurricane forecasting, and Robert Bazell was aboard just such a flight hours before Alicia hit Texas. Government planes loaded with scientific instruments took off from New Orleans airport to follow the course of Alicia. 
Previous flights and satellite photographs had given a good idea of the storm's location. But there is only one way to find out exactly what is happening in a hurricane, and that is to fly right through it. Heading for the hurricane, the plane passed over oil rigs which had been evacuated. The weather got much worse. At the edge of the hurricane, the clouds were solid, and the ride got rougher. You got 90 knots of wind now. The plane's radar clearly showed the hurricane. The large circle in the middle is the eye. Right here is where the most severe part of the storm is. Galveston's sitting right here. Then the plane moved through the inner edge of the hurricane's winds and clouds and entered the eye, the area in the center of the vortex of air, which is a hurricane. Here's a beautiful eye wall for you. Did you look out and see this thing up here? The eye wall is the fast-moving winds and clouds which surround the calm space of the eye. The plane continued flying through the hurricane most of the night. The crew reported a licious position to the Hurricane Forecast Center in Miami. But by early morning, there was little question where the storm was headed. Robert Bazell, NBC News, over the Gulf of Mexico. My name is James Knuckles. I am this date announcing my candidacy for the council seat of District 4. <laughs> Politics and religion. I'm not an individual and not as a minister. Although I have friends in many of the city churches, we have <laughs> In closing, May I say that I, I will bring to City Hall the expertise that is needed in the society in which we live. Thank you. George Thompson says he's been fighting City Hall for four years, and now he's giving up. It's too much of a fight. Mr. Thompson is the owner of the Masters Flea Market located just outside Montgomery. The city has been trying to get him to make certain changes on his property to bring it in line with building safety and fire codes. Among other things, city building inspector Karen Scruggs has asked Mr. Thompson to run water lines on the property to revamp its electrical wiring and to build permanent restrooms to replace these temporary facilities. But Mr. Thompson says these changes would cost him thousands of dollars, money he just doesn't have. Why can't you do it? Well, uh, partly because they're impossible. The other thing is because of the cost that I just can't afford to do them anymore because the cost is prohibitive. Meanwhile, Mayor Farmer's assistant, Jack Hogg, says he's studying Mr. Thompson's case, trying to find a way to help him keep his flea market open. Mr. Hogg says the city doesn't want to put anybody out of business, but he's not too optimistic about Mr. Thompson's chances since he says the facility could pose safety hazards to customers. For Mr. Thompson, the efforts may be too late anyway, since most of the 40 dealers who rent his booths are going elsewhere. Mr. Thompson sees the closing of the flea market as a loss, not only to himself, but also to the community. It's places where you can get bargains. There's a lot of people that couldn't have things that they have today if there weren't flea markets. It's places where people can make a little money, that they have stuff they need to sell to. I've had people come out that need enough money to buy their, to pay their telephone bill, and they come out and sell enough to pay their rent for the next month. Mr. Thompson says his is one of the last flea markets of its kind in Montgomery, and he says he's hung on as long as he could. I'm 67 years old. I fought this for four and a half years, and I'm, my wife just passed away, and I'm tired mentally and physically, and I just don't want to fight it anymore. Lois Russell, WSFA TV News. Tucked away on this short, narrow block is a bit of the 19th century, the Scott Street Fire Station, the city's oldest standing fire station, now belongs to a father and son renovation team. 
it could have been lost, but the city fathers of Montgomery were had enough foresight to realize that this was a very important building, and they made up their minds before they ever sold it that whoever bought it would restore it. I'm of the opinion that uh, most cities ought to have programs where buildings could be restored because these old buildings are lovely and they had really excellent architecture. The works delight in telling stories about the old station and the piece of city history they've saved. The firehouse is associated with the old volunteer fire companies. When they retired the horses that, that pulled the, the fire wagons for so many years, they took a team of horses across the river and put them out to pasture, and the horses had been here so long and evidently loved their job that they swam the river twice to come back to go to work. Uh, unfortunately, they didn't have a job when they came back. They'd been replaced by the, the engine-driven uh, fire engines. The Rourkes have made sure this bit of firefighting history is not lost. Susan Silvernail, WSFA TV News. I was a very strong supporter uh, of President Shanghai Sheck and uh, also have been a strong supporter of those who fight communism everywhere in the world. And uh, so I'm still a friend of Taiwan. Mr. Governor, you are the best friend of my country. You are always welcome to my country. Well, you're mighty kind, and I am a friend of Taiwan, and I believe the exports from Taiwan, uh, uh, with 17 million or more people, uh, is more than from the mainland in China, mm -hmm. under the communist system, the free enterprise system you yes. have in, right. Right. in uh, Taiwan. Emory Boulard's Mississippi State Bulldogs had one of the toughest six weeks in college football last year. After wins over Tulane, Arkansas State, and Memphis State, they met Florida, Georgia, Southern Miss, Miami, Auburn, and Alabama. They lost all six. It was a case of tough competition week after week and a devastating run of injuries. We replaced uh, Arkansas State with the Naval Academy. Uh, we played Tulane in the opening game. Uh, on campus, they're going to have a good football team, and we'll be opening up with them here under a new regime. So we're playing them blind. That's going to be a challenge in itself. We have an open date the following week, and in the next 10 weeks in a row, we play uh, about as tough a 10-game stretch as uh, you can imagine. So uh, it's going to require an awful lot, and uh, we're going to have to have a little good fortune to keep some people healthy. That's what happened last year. But if we can keep people healthy, I think we've got a chance to compete. Ballard believes his defense will be much improved this year, certainly more experienced with seven seniors and two juniors. They should give John Bond the ball in much better position this time. Bond is a senior this year. He's been a four-year starter, fabulously talented, but lacking the consistency to achieve the heights expected of him, maybe this year. Mississippi State still has that formidable six-week run when they play all those tough teams, but surely the injury jinx won't be quite so bad this time. This is Phil Snow reporting on the SEC Skywriters Tour, Starkville, Mississippi. The game is alive and well and kicking. We had a record 58 players drafted out of last year's folks informed, and hopefully we'll have some newsworthy things again. Every weekend and uh, work with Brent Musburger. They've beaten Texas twice in bowl games. They've beaten Ohio State. They've beaten Michigan. Oklahoma's going to have an excellent football team. Arizona's being picked as a very... Well, people look at me with a crooked eye, I guess, when I tell them I think it's going to be North Carolina. And the reason I've selected North Carolina is on the basis of their schedule. They do not play nearly as difficult a schedule this year as they have in the past. And also the fact that their bowl game record is outstanding. There are a lot of great teams uh, in the country, Auburn being one of them, and I think they're going to have a sensational team. But for them to go through the 11-game schedule that they have with the teams that they're playing, they've got to have a lot of good fortune. Even though they have a great ball club, they're playing the most difficult schedule in the United States, in my mind. 
considering? Yes, this has been very healthy. In fact, we've had one year to uh, analyze our uh, voting records and what have you, and we're in, a, we're in such a better position now to know what kind of legislators we have, and we can look at their action over the last year and get a better picture as to what we can expect from them in the future. Are there any that the ADC supported in the last election that they will not support this year? Yes, a, a one or two. And there are some when we back, and we're glad they won't be back. Yes. Yes, we'll be looking at presidential candidates, but we will not formally endorse presidential candidates until December 10th in Mobile. That we'll have a special assembly for the purpose of endorsing presidential candidates. This time around, we'll simply be looking at them, talking to them, and getting their views on various issues, and looking at, looking at their chances for success. You know, we have a criteria we look at uh, in order to uh, decide what candidate we're going to support. And one thing we look at, is, look at is electability. And of course, that will be one thing we'll be looking at, but certainly we won't make a decision on any presidential candidate this time, but we'll be looking at them for the future. Shortly before 4 o'clock this morning, fire units were called to 115 Windywood Drive to report of an apartment well involved in smoke and flames. Shortly after firemen arrived, additional fire units had to be called in to knock down the blaze. Deputy Fire Marshal Charles Kelly says the fire was allegedly started by 23-year-old Henry Payne of Greenville. The subject climbed upon the uh, balcony and then he began to uh, tear roofing off of the carnish overhang and then he uh, put what we believe to be a flammable liquid on the roof and then it uh, ran down the exterior part of the building and onto the balcony. And then he set the fire and then climbed down the balcony and ran. Shortly after firemen arrived on the scene, they issued a lookout for pain. Police picked him up about four blocks away at his brother's house. Authorities say the fire was started after domestic squabble. Deputy Fire Marshal Kelly says if it wasn't for the occupant of the apartment, Maggie Harrison, hearing noises on the roof, several people could have died in the fire. The lady that, was, that saw him, she uh, heard the noise that he was making as he was tearing the shingling off, and she walked out and looked and saw him. She was there, and uh, there are eight units in this apartment building, and all of the units, all eight of them, were occupied with people asleep. No one was injured in the blaze. Payne is charged with first-degree arson in the fire that caused between seventy-five and ninety thousand dollars worth of damage. By doing it at the home station, it makes it possible for these troops to be deployed directly to, to the area of assignment, wherever it would be. It eliminates the need, really, to go through the mobilization station. How long does that usually take if you have to send somebody to a mobilization station? <clears throat> well, normally the shortest time they would spend at one would be probably three weeks. Uh, we could save those three weeks here. Of course, some time is longer than that. Uh, depending on their mission and their assignment. I think uh, peace, international relationship, Central America, Mideast, all of these are also on their minds. Uh, the question of military, the question of, of deficit spending in the government is a is problem that's on the minds of the people. They are worried about the, the future and the national debt and trying to balance the budget. Uh, there are a number of different issues on the minds of various individuals. They will vary, but. Uh, the economy, I think, is the primary issue. Okay.
Ernest Fritz Hollings meeting with Governor George Wallace in April, meeting with Montgomery area Democrats in June, later the same month courting the young Democrats vote. And today in Auburn, Mr. Hollings was at an ice cream social, once again pushing hard for votes in a state he thinks will be very important in 1984. But Alabama was a key state because it's sort of uncontrolled, considered very southern, and uh, that's good for me. And I want to make sure that I don't just take it for granted. I'm in here working and working hard. The senator repeated much think, of what he uh, said on previous visits, attacking President Reagan and saying the primary concern in this presidential race is economic survival in a world economy. So what they really want is someone who is good at the art of governance, someone who believes in government, knows its limits, knows its responsibilities, has a track record of making government work. I balanced the federal government's budget the last time it was ever balanced in its history. There were less than 50 people at today's meeting, and Mr. Hollings admits his candidacy is a long shot. But that's what he says about all the Democratic contenders. What he says is important is narrowing the odds by election time. That's why he says he came to Auburn today, and why he drove to Montgomery afterwards to meet with the Alabama Democratic Conference. Lisa Walsh has that story. While ADC members were looking at presidential candidates today, their main concern now is the upcoming legislative elections on November 8th. The uh, State Democratic Executive Committee will uh, meet to nominate uh, its candidates uh, on the uh, 1st of October. And then, of course, sometimes between now and the 1st of October, uh, local leaders will be asked to give some opinions and recommendations concerning uh, of the candidates, but of course the final decision will be left to the members of the state committee. We would expect to increase uh, the uh, black, black numbers in the Alabama legislature from 17 to 19 in the House, and of course uh, from uh, uh, 3 to probably 5 in the uh, Senate. Chairman Reed said that the Montgomery ADC chapter will endorse candidates for the mayoral and council seats sometime before the October 11th election. The ADC will also endorse a presidential candidate this December at a special summit meeting in Mobile. As their name indicates, members of the Alabama Democratic Conference will be doing their best to defeat the Republicans in 1984. We are not Republicans, and we don't have an affirmative action program for the Republicans. Lisa Walsh, WSFA TV News. Great. Is running the full forties in our normal physical conditioning. Physical uh, conditioning. Yes, really. That uh, we do every year when the players come back. And we finish the last full forty. Trainers were actually with him because he had a difficult time finishing the last one. And uh, they stayed with him, I think. Actually brought him back to the Coliseum from the baseball field where we were having our running test. And uh, took him to the training room, put him in the shower and was actually coughing with him and, and uh, getting him cooled down. And he started having a difficult time breathing, at which time Herb Walker, our trainer, called paramedics. They got to call us in immediately. And by the time that they got there, he had actually, I think, stopped breathing. And uh, they begin to perform the necessary things to get his breathing started back and his heart to start back beating and so forth. But I think they got a heartbeat a couple of times, but I don't think anything real significant. Of course, in the meantime, the emergency squad came and took him to the hospital. I guess they worked with him for about two hours trying to trying to get a heartbeat. And then the doctors just came out and told me that it, that it was over. 
Pratt and a group of about 40 members of the Auburn team were running a series of 440 sprints as part of a routine preseason physical. He began complaining of cramps and later collapsed. After emergency medical attention, he was rushed to East Alabama Medical Center in Opelika. He was pronounced dead at 235. The cause of death, pending an autopsy, is heart failure. His coach, Pat Dye, met with the media after informing the team of Pratt's death. Dye said Greg had experienced heat exhaustion during the same type of drill last fall, but there had been no indication he would have any problem this time. We had a physical this morning, and there was really no indication that, that he couldn't you know, go out and run. As a matter of fact, that overall, this is the best conditioned football team I've ever been around in my life. And he's been working out with them all summer. Grief-stricken teammates were in shock. One of his best friends, defensive tackle Ben Thomas, said Greg Pratt would not be forgotten. You know, when I went in there, everybody, you know, was quiet. You know, they were shedding the little tears. Although, you know, they were really down. Not the way it's going to be for a while, you know, to everybody try to get over it. You know, you never, you can't forget it, you know, but, but we know we got to live on, you know, but most of all our game I, that we play this year, we're going to dedicate it to him. Pratt transferred to Auburn from Tennessee State, earning a starting role toward the end of last season, scoring his only touchdown on this run in the Tangerine Bowl. After an outstanding spring and 109 yards rushing in the spring game, the Albany Georgia native was listed as the number one fullback going into fall drills. He was to be a junior. Pratt was a month shy of his 21st birthday. Credit to his family and his community and the Albany University during the time that he was with Albany. This is not the best of times to be coming to Florida. Last December, the Gators were notified of an NCAA investigation into recruiting practices. So far, it's just that, an investigation. Does that cast a cloud over this year's Florida Gator football team? Head coach Charlie Pell. Well, what we're doing right now is getting ready to play football. And uh, that's what we're working on continuously. And uh, that's all we're working on. Other than that, we're doing what we're supposed to. We're cooperating. Uh, the, uh, you guys, do, you know, y'all do a good job of talking about it enough. We don't have to talk about it. Beyond the specter of an NCAA investigation, there's the back operation on star quarterback Wayne Peace last June. He's practicing, but he's not taking any contact. It's over with. I feel very relaxed. Uh, the back's strong. I'm throwing the ball well. I'm running well. And uh, I'm doing everything right now that all the other quarterbacks are doing except for the getting hit part. And, Is there uh, any psychological barrier you feel you must uh, pass? No, not at all. Uh, if I don't feel comfortable or 100% healthy, then I won't play. It's just that simple. You know, you don't play around with something like the back. But uh, I'm very relaxed and very confident about it. Let's say the NCAA thing doesn't bother them, and let's say peace comes back 100% from the back operation. Then the Gators can be good. I've told people all along, I think my senior year will be the best year we've had. You know, not because of me, just because of you know, growing around with the guys, growing up with them, being here with them. And there's a maturity about this team that's, that's uh, quite different from any other one I've played on. So uh, we've got as much of a chance as Auburn or any of the other great teams. So it's, it's going to be a dogfight. Wilbur Marshall may be the most intimidating player in the league. They'll be moving him around this year to keep teams from running away from him. We've been getting a lot of isolation, getting a lot of tight end on one side, double team, triple team, and um, um, people trying to slow me down my pursuit because of the way I run. Um, but they got to realize there's 10 other guys on the field. Yeah, so the idea is to get you into the play more often. Is that the... Uh, yes, yeah, let me run a little bit. Let me go in and do what I can do best. Florida plays all the contenders. If they can't win it, they'll certainly play a role in who does. This is Phil Snow reporting on the SEC Skyriders Tour in Gainesville, Florida. I've been, I've been, I have been out of a job for a year or something, and I finally found me a job. Well, I'm glad I did. I had got behind all of my bills and all this, no ideas. Trying to catch back up. Feel like I ain't gonna make it. But I some I catch up someday. Well, I'm worried about the war uh, that we may have. You know, I'm military retired, and uh, it bothers me a lot. I have two sons in the army, and 
Matter of fact, one of my sons just came from Germany last month. And he's on orders to go back to Germany the 12th of uh, September. You know? Uh, it's supposed to be a maneuver. But to me, it's getting kind of like preparation for another war. You know? So uh, hopefully it's not. Well, I tell you what, as far as I'm concerned, this is the best place in the world to live, right here in Enterprise, Alabama. Love it here. I think it's a great place to live. I'm glad to be here. We just visited Acapulco, Mexico, and we saw that it's nice to live in the United States because the way the people there live. Well, I guess the biggest thing, well, besides my annual pay raise in the military, would have to be the situation in uh, El Salvador. You know, being military, I guess you have to, that's probably the overriding thing. In 1981, each PSC member made $18,000 plus $1,000 a month for expenses, and the commission president drew almost $3,000 more than other members. But this year, PSC members started drawing a new salary, $40,000 a year for each member with an extra $500 for the president. That means with the new expense allowance, all commissioners are making more than $48,000 a year. But Commissioner Jim Folsom, Jr., who served for four years, says that's not out of line. I think if, if you look at the salary in relative terms, it's uh, adequate. Uh, if you look at the cabinet-level salaries, the, all of the appointments of the governor of Alabama, uh, almost all department heads throughout the state of Alabama uh, receive uh, at least that much in salary and in most cases much more. Mr. Folsom says compared to other states, Alabama was paying its commissioners less than any other commissioners in the country. And he says even now, Alabama's PSC is in the lower half of the pay scale. But there is another reason he supports the raise. Uh, another positive aspect, and I'm, I'm looking at the future, when, when Jim Folsom is no longer a member of the Alabama Public Service Commission, I think that uh, the salary will attract uh, responsible and, and qualified people uh, who will have the public interest at heart. The PSC governs trucking, railways, and many other forms of transportation, as well as utilities. Mr. Folsom says that means a lot of work. Will it mean even more money? He doesn't think so. Not now or in the foreseeable future. Tom Foreman, WSFA TV News. Well, we're very pleased that a national agreement has been, a tentative national agreement has been reached. Uh, we still have a hard three days of bargaining that'll be going on all over the country. For our particular affected area here, the majority of it will be in Birmingham. And we have every reason to be confident that by midnight, Wednesday night, the local agreement will be reached and our employees can return to work Thursday morning. We're obviously happy that a uh, tentative agreement on the national issues has been worked out. Of course, uh, South Central Bell and the uh, CWA District 10 bargaining committees have got to uh, come to an agreement on the local issues, and I understand they have until Wednesday at 11.59 uh, p.m. to do that. Uh, we are hopeful and optimistic that we can settle on the local issues, and uh, we're really looking forward to uh, getting everybody back to work. And uh, it looks like Thursday would be the earliest date that we could do that. Well, I feel real good. I think that uh, we achieved our goal. We didn't want to go in the beginning, but it was necessary, and uh, under the circumstances, I'm, I'm glad to see it in, and I feel sure that most of us are. Local company officials and union members are pleased with the tentative settlement, but none are happier than the non-union workers who have only had one day off since the strike began on August 7th. I don't know what the conditions are, but I'm glad it's over with. I'm happy the strike's over. I got a lot of friends on the picket line. I want back inside where they belong. Lisa Walsh, WSFA TV News. Checking the Georgia numbers, there's a 32, 
There's a 35, even a 43, but there's no 34. In the minds of most Georgia dog fans, the great Georgian tragedy happened a few months ago when Herschel Walker packed up his Heisman Trophy and went to the United States Football League, leaving Vince Dooley and his team in a quandary. I think that I'm over the shock now. I think our football team realizes uh, the reality that he's not here, and uh, we're going to miss him. Uh, that's obvious. Uh, we didn't miss him in the spring because we never had him in the spring. Uh, we really haven't missed him thus far. Uh, but where I know we'll miss him is when it's third and one, when it's third and two, or third and four, or fourth and one, and we gotta, we've got to have the first down to keep the drive alive, and I always start thinking about the first down play because I know we're going to get the first down. That's when we'll miss Herschel Walker. John Lastinger was a supporting player last year, his primary role to hand the ball to Herschel. But now he must accept the full glare of the spotlight. More emphasis is going to be shifted to the quarterback this year. I, I think in the past, well, a lot of times third down and four, third and three and a half, and uh, we'd give it to Herschel. And uh, you know, 60% of the time we were successful with that. And this year, I think uh, more emphasis will be shifted to the quarterback. We're probably going to be throwing in those situations, third and five, third and six. Uh, you know, you may see the quarterback coming out on the sprint, trying to trying to hit a, a quick one or running the ball himself. And so. You know, that's probably going to be the, the biggest difference, and uh, you know, it, it's exciting, but it's going to be a challenge. Some say Georgia will still be a good team, maybe a great team this year, but I don't believe that. There's just no way to replace Herschel Walker. If nothing else, just the improved mental attitude of Georgia's opponents will work against them. Simply put, Georgia without Walker will have to play the game everybody else has been having to play these last three years. This is Phil Snow on the SEC Skywriters Tour reporting from Athens, Georgia. Well, let's get over here and get out of the way so we First inning, Dick Ruthven delivers to Gerald Perry. Fly ball to shallow left field. No problem for Leon Durham. Yes, there is. He overruns it, and that opens the floodgates. Rafael Ramirez then comes to the plate. He singles through the left side. That scores Dale Murphy, and it's 3 to nothing Atlanta. And then Durham bobbles the ball with his bare hand. It almost allows Claudel Washington to score. Still first inning now. Brett Butler drills one through the right side. Bill Buckner boots it. Ramirez scores, and as Ryan Sandberg chases it down, Randy Johnson scores at 6 to nothing Braves. 45 minutes later, the Cubs came to the plate. Thad Bosley tagged Pasquale Perez for a solo homer to center over Dale Murphy at 6-1. Second inning action now. Claudel Washington robs Keith Moreland of extra bases with a fabulous diving backhand catch. This one goes in the trophy case. Still in the second inning, Jody Davis rips his 21st home run of the year out of the park to left. It's 6-2. The hit parade continues through the third. Durham atones for his poor fielding with a three-run blast to left. Wrigley Field goes nuts, and the Cubs are within one of Atlanta, 6-5. But in the fourth inning, Rich Bordy serves up a home run ball to Dale Murphy, a drive to deep left center. It's 7-5 Atlanta with a little more comfortable lead. Durham came back in the fifth inning, lining a double to right field. This one goes through Claudel Washington off the wall, scoring Thad Bosley. Ryan Sandberg comes around to score after him. It's 8-7 to seven Atlanta. Then in the seventh inning, Mel Hall steps to the plate. He sprays a solo home run off reliever Rick Camp. That shot to left makes it 11-8, to eight, but the Cubs run out of gas as Steve Bedrosian comes in and slams the door on Sandberg for the final out. Cubs lose the slugfest to Atlanta, 11-9. I don't know what a rib bump is. Hey, I love you, David Hartman. Think you swell is really fine. And Diane Sawyer at CBS, she really blows my mind. But Jane Foley and Brian Gumbel are still my favorite team. I watch them every morning on my teeny tiny TV screen. Brian Gumbel, Grandioso, Jane Foley, Romendioso. Jane Pauly is big enough for two. 
Dead step, one, two, three, four. Don't forget to shut the door. I like your cat, I like your style, I hope you like my style. Little Stevie Friedman is producer of our show. His temper is atrocious, and the phone book he will throw. He rants and raves and screams and yells. He really is a slob. But you would do the same thing if you had his job, right? Steve Friedman, I love you. Steve Friedman, crazy buddy. Today's show is just a show for me. Bam, two, three, I think I need a banana. My goodness, oh, hey. If you listen to the critics, you think this whole thing was just a hype. They say that we are fighting. We are fighting for our very life. Let me just remind you folks that lying is a sin. And come next fall with the help of y'all, we're going to be number one again. Yeah, 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 yeah. The critics, please. The critics, please. How come you never see any of them on TV? Right, right, right. What a crazy hat. I love it, Dad. I love the hair. Love the hair. Love the mic. Love it all. Don't even care. Now, David here and Barbara, dear, from San Francisco town, they brought some dough for USO, an idea that sound. And you can do the same and send that dough to USO and help our service people while you watch our little show, right? USO, today's show, it's all for the good cause. The cause is fine. I want some hard stuff across the board. What a dance. What a dream. What a team. What a kiss. I don't even... Hold it. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Let's have a little respect. Let's remember there's one shot left. There's somebody up there who really started this whole thing. Would you remove your hats, please, gentlemen? <clears throat> little guitar strum, please. Now, I know you're up there watching, floating on some puffy cloud. It's my idol, J. Fred Muggs, and he's feeling oh so proud. He's up there somewhere in chimpanzee heaven, just as happy as he can be. Cause he knows that ain't no crime to laugh a little on TV. Hey, J. Fred Muggs, I blocked my banana. J. Fred Muggs, that's the kind of monkey that I love. Oh, monkey shine, we love you. J. Fred Muggs is just the one for me. campaign for and against a dog track in Macon County is in its final hours. Supporters of the track say money from gambling will provide funds to run the county schools. Opponents say gambling money should not be used to finance the schools, and they plan a prayer vigil tonight at the Bowen United Methodist Church. Both points of view are represented in many parts of Tuskegee and Macon County in the form of posters, signs, bumper stickers, and decorated cars and vans. Macon County has about 15,000 registered voters and some county officials estimate about half of them will vote on the issue. A majority of the votes cast are expected to come from the three polling places in the city of Tuskegee. There are nine other voting places out in the county. Results from the city of Tuskegee are expected to come in quickly, but it may be an hour or more before the tabulations from out in the county are delivered to the courthouse. Dennis Latham, WSFA-TV News, Tuskegee. Cleveland Avenue was crossed out of the district this time. Uh, and we did not, uh, we took about 30 votes, I believe, out of that district, out of about 2,000. This time, Carriage Hills has been put in there on the Aldersgate box. I feel that area is a business-oriented area, a conservative area, and an area that will vote Republican. My opponent does not have the time to devote to the district, and I do, and I feel that I'm qualified, and I do have the time. I would take more time to devote to the residents of the politics of confrontation and stagnation that we've had for the past several years, or whether we will begin to make God, as you said, rumbles that he does not return calls. Embracing the heat. As all of you are well of us interested in bringing change to District 3, 
unite and begin to work together in our efforts. I wish to take this opportunity to offer myself to the people of District 3 as their I noticed him looking at it. reforms in old ways are underway. All of those who were trying to help. It was a natural thing to do. Plus we have pushed out in the, in the neighboring areas and we're going to continue to push out in the neighboring areas because we're taking seriously our, our position to be the capital city newspaper. And we know from my experience that the small dailies and the small weeklies down south and east and and I emphasize east and west and south of us are not financially able to staff and report the activity of Gold Hill like we are. And I'm not, I'm not advantaged to know what's going on in the world. And I agree with you. I agree with them. And once again, we're going back live to Auburn University. Don Phelps of our staff. And Don, we've got uh, the technical problems worked out on this end. I understand that the, uh, the mood is rather somber after today's announcement by the coroner. Very somber, Bob. And although additional tests are still being run in the case, Coroner Williams did say that Greg Pratt's death was a result of a heat stroke. He says doctors found no trace of drugs or alcohol in Pratt's body. And as far as he's concerned, Greg Pratt's death was an accident. This is the kind of accident that could have occurred at any time strenuous activity is involved, such as cutting grass. It's a golfer's uh, chief complaint this time of the year. Mr. Williams says the fact that it happened during a football physical is purely coincidental and Pratt received the best possible medical attention. Auburn coach Pat Dye says a running test that Pratt took is strictly routine. Although he says his staff is evaluating how the test should be run next year, he doesn't think there'll be any changes. What we're talking about is not, a, is not really a problem. It is not really a problem. It was a problem in this case. It was a problem Saturday. And it's something that has got all of us, our lives, torn to pieces right now. When asked by reporters if the running test is a good test, Coach Pat Dye says, when something like this happens, it's a bad test. Bob? 
Well, uh, the question that a lot of people are asking, have things normalized as far as schedules and drills are concerned? As far as schedules, everything is pretty much back to normal, a rather somber mood. Uh, they began the three-day workouts today. This is the first full day of practice. Matter of fact, practice is going on right now here on the Auburn University campus, Bob. Thanks a lot. Don Phelps live at Auburn University. We'll have more on that from Auburn in tonight's sports segment. I'm sanding gravel coming. Oh, I certainly agree with that, and I just want to warn that uh, when we do that, don't think we are here because the, the that's that we live in a lot. A number of projects that we're trying to come up for work. Where we pay taxes now, and the city is giving some city. We're, we're allowed. Well, we're talking about the city. We're the city. Right. They don't want to do that. We live for young folks up out there. I, mean, yeah, well, I, think, I think the commission of the Cahaba Road, that actually, when you say... In 1981, 796 infant deaths were reported in Alabama. That's 12.9% per 1,000 live births. In 1982, 831 infant deaths reported, or 13.8% per 1,000 live births. That's an increase of 7% from 1981 to 1982. State Health Department officials are concerned about that increase, which they say stems from a number of factors, including worsening economic conditions. If people do not have easy access to medical care, if they're recently unemployed and have financial problems, they tend to put off medical care, and this can add to medical problems, and it affects with an increased infant mortality. Mr. McVeigh says while Alabama isn't alone in its problems with infant mortality, the 1982 rate of 13.8% is still well above the national average of 11.1. But he says there's a bright spot in all these statistics. We're very pleased that the Alabama has continued to improve its infant mortality rate. Over the last 11 years, we've had a 40% improvement in infant mortality. Over the last 20 years, we've had about 100% improvement in infant mortality but we still have a long way to go. Mr. McVeigh says state and local health departments are still working to educate the public about prenatal and postnatal care, hoping to reduce the infant mortality rate even more. Lois Russell, WSFA TV News. We really took an interest in their problem because all of us basically have healthy children. And it's hard to think what you would do if you had their problems. Tennessee. A 6-5-1 team last year has been picked to win the national championship this time by Sports Magazine. Coach John Majors, who knows what a championship team looks like, having coached one at Pittsburgh, is skeptical. Oh, my, my initial reaction was a, a great shock, but I didn't really uh, try to, to overreact to it because I don't think there was a lot to overreact about. We're not close to being anything to, like a national championship contender, to be honest with you. I wish we were, and I wish I could say differently. I, I believe we can be better, but I don't think many people would, uh, with a lot of good judgment, would predict a team to be number one in the country with the 10th returning defense in the, in the conference coming back. I wish I could say differently. The Vols allowed more yardage last year than any in its fabled history. Majors knows an improved defense is the top priority, with special attention to a youthful secondary. On the positive side, quarterback Alan Cockrell is as good as any. The offensive line has good potential. And Tennessee's kickers, Jimmy Colquitt, the punter, Fod Rivez, the kicker, may be the best pair in all of college football. John Majors enters his seventh season at Tennessee. They've had some good years, but never the big one. They have at least a chance this time with what some believe to be Majors' best team since he returned home to Tennessee. This is Phil Snow reporting on the SEC Skywriters Tour from Knoxville, Tennessee. Should Greg Pratt been allowed to run in a timing test in hot weather, 
the same test that sent him to the hospital last year. That's the main question posed to Auburn coach Pat Dye by reporters this afternoon. Greg Pratt had trained with our football team all summer and, and uh, was as, probably as in a, a, as good a condition as he could be in at this time. And uh, there's just no reason to suspect that he couldn't go out and, and, and run them. Coach Dye says it's a fact of life. If you're a football player and you live in the South, you have to play in the heat. But that doesn't diminish the effect Pratt's death has had on the team and Coach Dye. And it's something that has got all of us, our lives, torn to pieces right now. Although additional tests are still being run, Corner Williams says as far as he's concerned, Pratt's death was an unforeseen tragic accident. This is the kind of accident that it could have occurred at any time strenuous activity is involved. Mr. Williams says there were no traces of drugs or alcohol found in Pratt's body, and he says the young player received the best possible medical attention he could have received. Don Phelps, WSFA TV News, Auburn. Hey Bob, as we did hear, hear earlier, Lee County Coroner John Williams said this afternoon that the death of Auburn football player Greg Pratt was an accident that could have occurred at any time strenuous activity was involved. The exact cause of death is listed as heat exhaustion. Standing by live in Auburn, close to the practice field where the Tigers are going through an afternoon practice session, is Don Phelps with more on the story. Don? Rick, right now the flags on the Auburn University campus are flying at half-staff in memory of Greg Pratt. And uh, according to coach Pat Dye, he says the death of Pratt has had a very solemn effect on his teammates. Well, I, th I think it's been probably a little quieter than normal, but kind of a, just a business-like approach to it as far as they're concerned. They've, you know, they've gone about their business and without a lot of added enthusiasm. Coach Dye says the team's plans for the funeral are uncertain at this time. He says those players who want to attend the funeral Thursday afternoon in Albany, Georgia, will probably be bussed over after an early morning practice. There will also be a memorial service held on the Auburn campus Thursday. Coach Dye says the team is also considering other ways of paying tribute to Greg. Hey, bye. One that has already been mentioned to me, if we have no problem with it, we'll probably get a little 36 and put it on the back of our headgear. And, um, you know, we may do something else as far as a memorial before, before it's all over. But, you know, it's, it's too early to say exactly what right now. Coach Dye says the death of Greg Pratt has been very tough on him. He says right now his first concern is with his team. He'll worry about himself later. Rick? Okay, Don, thank you. Don Phelps reporting live from Auburn. Well, it's really lonesome in the backfield with without Greg because we're always, you know, jiving and playing with him and stuff like that, calling him names, not bad names, but, you know, it just doesn't seem right for him to be gone. Basically, what the team, I think, what, what they tried to do today was overlook it, you know, try to hide it to the best that they can. Were they able to do that? Somewhat, but, you know, deep down and, and, and sometimes you catch somebody off by themselves, you know, wondering, thinking, and you know what they're thinking about. You know, I did it a lot today, yeah. What do you think about when you're by yourself? Why? <laughs>